Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that precious truth. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying uh, together in the first epistle to the Thessalonians, verse by verse. And we are now in chapter 4. I had mentioned in my previous video that uh, all five chapters of 1 Thessalonians end with a reference to Christ's return. And uh, I looked at that and I found that most interesting. I thought that I'd take special note of each of those passages uh, and see if there was any any kind of common denominator or you know or if the thought surrounding uh, those mentions of his coming were is connected some way. So I did that and when I strung it all together, well, it, it seemed to contain a message of sorts. Now, this is just what I saw. It may be not what you see. You may see something different. But I, I base this on, on what the immediate context was uh, in each one of those references. So in chapter 1, it was no judgment. In chapter 2, it was God's family. Uh, chapter 3, that we are unblameable. We stand unblameable uh, before God. And in chapter 4, a pre-trib rapture. Well, actually it doesn't say pre-trib, but it's the rapture, and we know that to be pre-trib. And then in chapter 5, we're secure. Uh, we see perseverance, God's faithfulness. So uh, we're secure, and all this because God is faithful. So when you string that all together and you read that together, it reads like this. No judgment for God's family who stands unblameable until the rapture, secure because God is faithful. And I find that interesting. And I thought I'd just pass that along to you. So we're going to continue on now in this study of uh, chapter 4. I'd like to try to cover verses 1 through 8. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. Uh, this this passage, folks, deals with uh, more specifically or more directly, it, de it just deals with the believer's walk. Our walk, our uh, conduct, our behavior. There is a way that we walk. There's a, a way that believers are to walk. Uh, we... Uh, I've mentioned this numerous times. I, I, I think I can. It's best I continue to keep mentioning the fact that God is the author of this book. Okay. We know that Paul wrote Thessalonians, but God is the author. And so, beginning at verse one, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ. The word beseech there is, is eratao. It means to ask, uh, make an earnest request, uh, especially by someone on special footing. That is, uh, in, in, in preferred position. Uh, expecting to receive special consideration because of the special relationship involved. The word exhort and I'm, I'm looking at the King James Version here. I, I usually do that. Uh, oftentimes I'll jump over to the New American Standard. But uh, for the sake of, of most of my, my viewers, most of my followers who are accustomed to the authorized text, uh, most of this you'll see me, you'll, you'll see that I'm referencing the King James. The word uh, exhort, uh, parakaleo, uh, the the word is translated personally make a call it it refers to believers offering up evidence that stands up in god's court by the lord jesus 
Now, the preposition is actually, not, it's not by. The preposition is in, in Christ. In, the Lord, in, in Lord Jesus is how, literally how the Greek reads. That as ye have received of us. As ye have received of us. Well, uh, if you remember in our study in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, as ye there have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Well, how did we receive the Lord Jesus Christ? Did we receive Him uh, based upon uh, something that uh, did... Yeah. You know, I guess that's an entire video all in, uh, of its own there. But we didn't receive Jesus Christ in the sense that we did anything to be redeemed. We didn't receive Jesus Christ uh, on, on the, the, as a condition whereby if we received Christ, then Christ would do something for us or that Christ would redeem us if we did something, whether it was believe, receive, repent, be baptized, or anything else. Uh, as ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. We walk in Him in the same way that we received Him. And that was by grace. How ye ought to walk Okay, and to please God. How you ought to walk and please God. We know, folks, that it, without, faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In our study through Ephesians, uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, we read, As a prisoner in the Lord, then I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received. That's not walking in order to try to attain some state of worthiness or that if we walk in a certain way, God considers us worthy. We're to walk in a, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've received is to, is to walk as who we are, that we have been made worthy. Colossians 1.10 in our study and through Colossians, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Same identical phrase. Walk in a, a manner worthy. If, if you folks are interested in, in how the Christian is to walk, behave, conduct his life, in this present age, as a Christian, this video is going to... The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in this first epistle to the Thessalonians and in this fourth chapter spells it out, lays it out clearly how, we're, how we are to walk. And you may be, many, many of you watching this may be surprised to find out that our walk, that, that walking in a, in a manner worthy of the Lord, where that we please Him in every way, may be quite different than what you've been accustomed to, 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 to believing or having heard. Modern Christianity, in the main, believes that we, we, we walk as Christians, that our walk is one which is, we're trying to please God. There's a, but there's a big difference, folks, in walking in a way to where that we're trying to please God and walking in a way where that we know that we please God, that, that God is pleased with us. It pleases God for us to walk in a way in which we recognize that God is pleased with us, if that makes any sense at all. I've often mentioned how that we, we tend to put the cart before the horse. It's us for we we focus on what we must do and if we do we if we do number one and number two and number three and number four, if we go through these steps and we do these certain things, then God is pleased with us and that's our walk. 
nothing could be further from the truth. Walking after the Spirit. What does it mean to walk after the Spirit? Well, it's that's that's absolutely the uh, antithesis, you, you might say, of walking according to the flesh. Once we come to understand that walking according to the flesh is walking according to law, then it, then it makes every bit of sense to understand that walking after the Spirit is walking in grace. We walk after the Spirit. We, we recognize the fact of the, of the, we, we recognize the reality that we, ha we are a dual-natured creature. We have an old man and a new man. The new man can do nothing but righteousness. All the old man does is sin. So we're walk, to walk in the Spirit is to walk in the new man, the one that's been made righteousness, been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, Steve, we're under, we, we got to still be under some, some aspect of the law. Listen to Romans 8, 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, not after the law, but after the Spirit. It's amazing how that uh, we actually come to do the law by not living under, under the law. Now, I, I know that that may sound crazy to, to a lot of you, but this is, this is the absolute truth of the matter. That the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In Philippians 3.17, we read, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Paul here in 1 Thessalonians, is, or more particularly, God, the Holy Spirit, is concerned that we walk in a way that is pleasing to God, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, Walk in according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Walk in grace, not law. And by doing so, we are, we are, we walk according to the pattern, okay, that God has laid out for us here. In 1 Corinthians 4 16, it's therefore I urge you to imitate me. Imitate. What, what is he talking about? Imitate. Im is certainly not imit Paul is not saying I keep the law so I want you to keep the law. That's that's not what he's saying. I'm walking under grace, I'm walking according to the spirit, I'm walking as worthy because I have been made worthy. I want you to imitate me. 1 Corinthians 11:1. 1, you are to imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Wow. Well, okay, Paul, so Paul is saying he imitates Christ. You know, it kind of reminds me of the little bracelets. You know, they I, I, I saw once. You know, the you know, what would Jesus do? Uh, WWJD. You know, it had you know printed on the the bracelets. You know, I, I, that never really set well with my spirit, folks. We don't copy Christ. We don't, in the sense that we, we don't imitate Christ in the sense that that well, well, Christ kept the law perfectly. Okay, so we got to try to do the same. Our relationship with the Lord, dearly beloved, is much, much more complex, yet simple than that. It's, it's much more profound than that. It isn't trying to be like Christ by keeping the law. It's deeper than that, as we'll see in verse 4 of our text here. Verse 4 is going to talk about how we possess our vessel, but, you know, we're not there yet. Folks, we need to understand two things. We need to understand position versus condition. Okay? Our position is one thing. Our condition is another. The, the new man does what our text describes. It always does. And what a comfort that that is. That, that's all it can do. So 
This is actually in harmony with what we learned when we looked at the judgment seat of Christ, Bema, where that, that even in our lives, those of us who are, who are walking according to the Spirit, not the flesh, there will be hay, wood, and stubble that's, that's, purified, that's filtered out of that. that you know, in every single one of our lives, not one of us will escape there being hay, wood, and stubble. But when at, at the judgment seat of Christ, we're purified, and all, all of those impurities, hay, wood, and stubble, that which is, was done in the flesh, is burned up, leaving only gold, silver, precious stone. Our text here, this is why the Holy Spirit can say, so ye would abound more and more. Why does he say, so, you know, you can't read that without, without realizing that what, what the Holy Spirit is, is saying to us here and maybe to our surprise, is that every single born-again believer in Christ is walking according to the Spirit to some extent, to some, in, to some degree. But we are to abound more and more. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12, we read, And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone else, just as our love for you overflows. In, in verse 10 of chapter 4 here, we will read, And indeed you are showing this love to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to excel more and more. So the call is to excel more and more in, 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 as, as it regards our relationship to God through, through that understanding of our new man that we've been made a new creation in Christ and that it is the, the flesh profits nothing every child of God walks in the spirit to some extent look at verse 2 for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus now I, I can see where many legalists would read that and, and automatically the law Moses you know, the Ten Commandments or, 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 or the whole entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, everything that God says do and everything that God says don't, that's, that, that's all rolled up into the commandments that we were given by the Lord Jesus. And that is not true. We know, it says, for ye know, it says, what commandments we gave you by Moses. No, by the but by the Lord Jesus. We know what commandments. What was the first commandment? What is the first commandment? The first time, and I pointed this out in the past, the first imperative, the first command in the Greek, in the grammar, the first command that's in the imperative mood, the, first, the very first command that we're given is, in, is found in Romans 6.11. We reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. That's, that's the first commandment. Do you really care about the commandments that we were given by the Lord Jesus? Well, if you do, then your first commandment, if you, if you, I hardly know how to put this into words. I, I, I meet a brother that's, that thinks that believes that we're living under law and he's, he's, he's just all about law and he's preaching to me about law, how we've got to be, we're under some aspect of the law. That we got to keep God's commandments. We have to, we must keep God's commandments. My response to this brother would be, if you really care about keeping God's commandments, my question is, are you keeping the first one? Romans 6.11 Dead to sin, alive unto God in Christ. The text doesn't say, for you know what commandments we gave you by Moses. 
Verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. God willed that we be set apart to abstain from fornication. We didn't set ourselves apart. We don't set ourselves apart. We have been set apart, sanctified, sanctified by God by one sacrifice forever, Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And our text says to abstain from the fornication. Folks, it's articulated. It, it doesn't say fornication. It says the fornication. And any of you Greek students can easily go to your interlinear and you can see the word the there that precedes the word fornication. The fornication. God could have easily just said fornication. He didn't say that. He said the fornication. Why is that? Because the context here that we're looking at is not on sexual immorality, sleeping with your brother, your brother's wife, uh, having premarital sex, or anything else. And folks, I'm, before anybody starts criticizing me here and correcting me on, on well, Steve, surely that, that, that must also refer to fornication in the physical sense. I have no doubt that, that, that the implication is there. But context, folks, is extremely important. The context is our walk, okay? The context here in which we are told to abstain from the fornication, it's articulated, is our walk. It, to me, it, it just it, even it's, it would seem odd that God would just all of a sudden, in, in referring to our walk, the first thing that He would bring up is, well, I, okay, I don't want you to have any, any uh, illicit sexual relationships. You know, this is your, your walk. This is your walk that I'm talking about here. So I'm going to now put you under law. And I'm just going to say, you know, don't covet your neighbor's wife. I, folks, listen to me. I've mentioned many times how we need to slow down and look at the text in context. The fornication. And, and when we come to understand what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is, is, to, is referring to here, all of this falls into place. It all makes sense. You know, in talking about God's will, Christians all the time, they wonder, you know, if, if this or that or the other thing is His will. I've had people come up to me and say, Steve, do you think I, you know, I ought to move to such and such city or take such and such job or marry such and such person? Or Over the years, I've heard, it just, it, the, it, goes, it goes on and on. You know, they wonder if, if this thing or the other thing is His will, which He has not revealed in His Word. Folks, you will never in this book, okay, nothing from cover to cover will you ever see anything mentioned about, you know, what job you ought to take, what city you ought to live in, uh, who you ought to marry, what gal you ought to marry, or, or what, what husband you ought to, you know, what man you ought to marry, or, or how many kids you ought to have, or you know, whether you ought to do this job or that job or anything else. And this gets into the matter of, well, God spoke to me. You know, He wanted me to do such and such, and He spoke to me. He, he, made, it, he made it clear that... And, it, and before anybody criticizes me here, I'm not saying that God can't lead or direct a person's heart to marry a certain person or to take a certain job. I'm not saying that. What I will say is that He doesn't speak to us apart from His Word. And so they're concerned about all these, this stuff which He has not revealed in His Word, while strangely not caring much about what He has revealed is His will in His Word, if you follow what I'm saying here. You won't find one verse in this book telling you what job to take or what city to move to or what person to marry or what to invest your money in 
or many other things, things which, which so many Christians are so often concerned about. And I will boldly insist that God doesn't speak to us apart from His Word today. Everything that He wanted us to know, folks, He revealed in this book. Okay? No new revelation, so-called revelation, is given. You know, to only a special category of believers. You know, given to a select few because they somehow earned that special privilege to, to hear some message from God uh, that He didn't give to everybody else by something that they did that, you know, that the rest of us poor souls, well, we just, we didn't deserve to know this. Or something special given to one child of God because somehow His Word wasn't sufficient. God has revealed His Word all through this book and we are seeing part of that here. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from the fornication. The fornication. Okay? Our God is a jealous God. Physical fornication, of course. Of course. But the context, it's kind of a given. You know, most Christians know they're not to do that such things, but the context reveals this to be God's concern regarding spiritual fornication, which is far, far worse, in my opinion. The, the context here, dearly beloved, concerns a walk pleasing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The law, which defines most of modern preaching today, is not of faith. If we are married and we have an affair with another, that's adultery. To be espoused to Christ while having an affair with the law is spiritual adultery. Our God's a jealous God. Just look at Romans 7, chapter 7. 7, beginning with verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Okay? Death. Now, we'll see that death Broken fellowship, that's not hell. We'll see that warned about in verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should, we should serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. That is the law. Spiritual adultery, folks, is seen throughout both the Old and, and the New Testaments. And we have to make sure that we do not go beyond, go beyond, that is, cross the line and defraud or cheat anybody, any brother in this matter. Verse 6. Because God is the avenger of such. Oh, Steve, I thought we weren't under condemnation. There was therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's true, and we, and we don't want to throw out Romans 8.1. Don't throw away Romans 8.1. Here, folks, don't do that. Okay? We will suffer the consequences of this fornication, the fornication, the spiritual adultery. Okay? Defrauding a brother. We will suffer the consequences of that in this life. Although it does stand true that there's therefore now condemn, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I believe that's what the text is saying. Now in the Old Testament, it was idol worship. Anything that became an idol in, in people's lives. Same, same today. That idol being anything that drives a wedge between us and our fellowship with God. Our God is a jealous God. Law does that in the believer's life today. Christ, who fulfilled the law perfectly, the very embodiment of the law, the very one who fulfilled the law perfectly, is now telling us that we are in Him 
and, and we have Him living, the very fulfillment of the law living in and through us, and we are not to live according to the law. We're to walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Yes, our God is a jealous God. Okay? And we're talking about our walk here. That's the context. That's the overall context, is how we live a life pleasing to God. Do you want to live a life pleasing to God? Law does that. Law is what does that in the believer's life today. Legalism, that is walking according to the flesh, that which diminishes or, or just outright ignores the perfect finished work of Christ in our lives. And the fact that He is our life, not I, but Christ. Christ manifest. Christ lived, living His life in and through us apart from law. The righteousness that is based on faith. Okay? Faith's righteousness. It's a genitive. It's a righteousness that belongs to faith. Faith owns it. It's faith's righteousness. Righteousness. It's a righteousness that comes on the basis of faith. We're past our new birth here. We're talking about our walk. And again, now, we see verse 4, that every one of you perfectly knows how to possess, that is, the word possess is acquire, his vessel in sanctification and honor. We know that. How do we know that? Because of his word. So again, we see the word know. We perfectly know because we have His Word. We know how to possess our vessel, to acquire our vessel in sanctification and honor. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that what? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Just like we walk in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence. That's a strange word, I know. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. Lust of concupiscence. That is self-passion. Self-passion. The word there means inordinate, unreasonable, unjustifiable desire. A longing. Unrestrained self-will. Which, actually, which lies in contrast to the God's will, which we see in verse 3. Verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud. The, actually, that word defraud, the, the root of that word is covetousness. Okay? It's, it's covet, to desire to have more. That's it, trampling on the rights of others. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. You know, of course we're not to take our brother's wife. But moreover, we're not to defraud our brother in Christ by driving him or her away from fellowship with Christ by preaching law instead of grace. Okay? God is the avenger of such. Because... Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you, forewarned you and testified, says our text. Forewarned and testified. Dearly beloved, we're looking at a grace walk as opposed to a law walk, a merit-based walk. That which is fleshly, that which is earthly, that which only the Gentiles who don't know God no, that's all they know. As we ha also have forewarned you and testified. So apparently, they had heard this from Paul when he was there at, at Thessalonica. As far as we are concerned, we have heard this throughout Paul's epistles. You and I, we've, we've, we've heard the Holy Spirit has testified to this, forewarned us, testified concerning this all throughout the New Testament. And remember, it's God speaking here. Though Paul was the writer, God's the author. 
I take the Lord as the avenger as being the death that results from broken fellowship. Not death in the sense of God's wrath or God's hell. We're looking at believers here whom, whom we already have seen are blameless. They stand before God without spot, folks. We can't abandon one truth for another. We have to build precept upon precept here. I'm talking about the death that results from broken fellowship. Romans 8, 6. The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Is that talking about dying physically? No. Is it talking about, well, you know, if, if we believers who live according to the flesh are going to live a shorter life physically? No. Or they're going to go to hell? No. Christ died in their place. What does that mean? For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through, through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What is that saying? It's saying that he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Life everlasting. That's zoe in the Greek, life, that, that, that eternal life, that is quality of life. It's, it, it has nothing to do with with, with ex extension of life, the uh, du duration of life. Eternal life, folks, is we tend to think of it as, well, that's a long time, okay? Eternal life, or the, just the word life is, as God uses it, is that word zoe denotes the quality of life. It, so we have that even here. And now, which is the result of walking in the Spirit. So in this sense, the Lord is the avenger of, of such ones. But these are His people we're talking about, who have been redeemed freely by His grace. They are His because He died in their place. But it's a serious matter. It's, it's a sobering verse. It's a sobering statement. Okay. We don't put one another under law. In fact, we don't we don't even put them the temptation is to put them under law just to get them under grace. Same thing, amounts to the same thing. We can't do that, folks. So it was and is God's will that we be sanctified, that is, set, set apart, set aside to abound more and more in that particular walk of grace that's worthy of our calling, worthy of who we are in Christ, a walk that pleases God, and that for the sake of Christ, for the sake of ourselves, as well as one another, because we all share the same Spirit. Anything else is uncleanness. Verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God considers law-keeping, legalism, flesh, uh, walking according to the flesh, uh, a human merit-based religious system. He considers that unclean. We've been called unto holiness. That's not to make ourselves holy. It's, it's to realize that we are holy. That because that, that's what we are. To live as who we are. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. Verse 8 clearly reveals the fact that God is well aware. He's well aware of the fact that when we proclaim this vital truth to others and we think we're being despised, well, they're not despising us. They're despising Him, not us. He therefore that despiseth, 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 that's kind of a hard word to say, not man, despiseth not man, but God. And then he adds, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. 
the one also giving us his spirit, says the Greek. So the two thoughts there are, are connected. Properly, I'd translate that, they despise God who gave us his spirit. Not, not that they know that that's what they're doing, but that is what they're doing. And, and the words, hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit, that, that, that witnesses to our spirit. And that ought to be a real comfort to us. It is God's testimony. As we also have forewarned you and testified. Verse 6. Again, I, and I, I know I, I keep repeating this, but folks, this, these are God's words. They're not Paul's. It's not Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic. We're looking at God's word to us. Paul just held the pen. We have the testimony of God, the witness of God in our spirit. He bears witness in our spirit to the fact that these things, His Word, is true. And may God seal to our hearts these truths. Well, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I want to take a moment to thank you all for your continued prayers for this ministry. I, I beseech you for your, you know, to pray for this ministry and its direction in the, the months ahead. We're fastly approaching, uh, well, we're halfway through 20. Uh, time seems to be really, at least in my experience, time seems to be really going by swiftly. We'll be in 2021 before you know it. I, I do appreciate you all. I love your comments. I, I, I'm so grateful that you leave these encouraging comments for me on YouTube. I appreciate all of those comments, those words of encouragement uh, that you give me on Facebook and on this channel. I, think, I appreciate you. I love you. Uh, appreciate all of you who are supporting this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.